chapters nine and ten of the last three soldiers by william henry shelton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine the plateau receives a name it was now october and time to being harvesting the crop on the little plantation which something very like an inspiration had prompted philip to plant while lieutenant coleman continued work on the house stopping the chinks between the logs with clay and repairing the roof of the hut with spare shingles bromley and philip topped the corn cutting off the stalks above the ripened ears then the potatoes were thrown out of the mellow soil with a wooden shovel and left to dry in the sun while a level place was prepared in the centre of the plot and thickly spread with a carpet of dry stalks upon this surface after removing a few bushels to the hut the crop was gathered into a conical heap and thatched over with stalks and then the whole was thickly covered with earth and trenched about to turn off the water it was estimated that this cache contained thirty bushels which according to the tables in the blue book revised army regulations would exceed the potato ration of three men for a period of five years from the day of their arrival on the mountain lieutenant coleman had never failed to make a daily entry in the station journal and now that they had set up a country for themselves he foresaw that the continuance of this practice would be necessary if they were not to lose the record of weeks and months his entry was always brief often it was no more than the date and even the more important events were set down with the utmost brevity and precision once a week he noted the recurrence of the sabbath and on that day they suspended ordinary labor and if the weather was pleasant inspected their increasing domestic comforts on the mountain top and laid their plans for the future after their military habit the morning of sunday was devoted to personal cleanliness and to tidying up about their quarters as the commissary supply of yellow bars diminished it was evident that the time would soon come when they should be obliged to make their own soap back of the chestnut tree in which they had taken refuge from the bear was a peculiar hollowed rock and above it a flat shelf of stone on which philip erected a hollow log for leaching ashes a little patient chipping of the upper stone with the axe head made a shallow furrow along which the lye would trickle from the leech and fall into the natural basin in the rock below which was large enough to hold a half barrel this was a happy device as the strong liquid would have eaten its way through any vessel other than an iron pot or an earthen jar of which unfortunately they possessed neither they had but a limited supply of hard corn from which they selected the best ears for the next year's planting these they braided together by the husks and hung up in yellow festoons from the rafters of the hut which they continued to use as a storehouse much of what remained of their small crop would be needed by the fowls in the winter and up to this time they had made no use of it for their own food meal was out of the question and to break the flinty kernels between stones was a tedious process to which they had not yet been forced to resort the presence of the lie however suggested to bromley the hulled corn of his new england grandmother which he had seen her prepare by soaking and boiling the kernels in a thin solution of lye by this means the hulls or skins were removed and after cleansing from potash and boiling all day the unbroken kernels became as white and tender as rice this satisfied the three soldiers for a time and made an agreeable addition to their diet of bear steak and potatoes in the mountains of tennessee lieutenant coleman had once seen a rude hydraulic contrivance called a slow john which was a sort of lazy man's mill to construct this affair it was necessary to have a bucket which bromley set about making by the slow process of burning out a section of chestnut log with a red-hot ramrod of a carbine at a short distance above the house the branch which flowed from the spring after making its refreshing way between grassy banks tumbled over a succession of ledges which ended in a small cascade and twelve feet below this waterfall there was a broad flat rock which laved its mossy sides in the branch and showed a clean flat surface above the level of the water below this rock they built a dam of stones by means of which they could flood its surface 
four feet upstream from the rock a log was fixed from bank to bank for a fulcrum and upon this rested a movable lever the short arm of which terminated above the submerged rock while the long arm just touched the water of the cascade a wooden pin set in the under log passed through a slot in the lever so as to hold it in position and at the same time give it free play another flat stone of about thirty pounds weight which was the pestle of the mortar was lashed with grapevine thongs to the short arm of the lever directly over the submerged stone to the long arm was attached bromley's bucket baled with a strong wire and so hung as to catch the water of the cascade as the bucket filled and sank its weight raised the flat stone higher and higher above the submerged rock until the bucket met a bar fixed to tilt its contents into the stream when the upper millstone came down upon its fellow with a fine splash and thud after a wall of clay had been built about the surface where the two stones met to keep the corn in place the slow john was ready for work it was slow but it was sure and after that when one of the three soldiers awoke in the night it was cheerful to hear the regular splash and crash of the slow john like the ticking of a huge clock lazy enough to tick once a minute and patient enough to keep on ticking for two days and nights to pulverize as many quarts of corn and now for three young men who had solemnly renounced their country and cut themselves off voluntarily from all intercourse with their kind they were about as cheerful and contented as could be expected in spite of the great disaster which they believed had befallen the national cause their lungs expanded in the rare mountain air and the good red blood danced in their veins and with youth and health of body it was impossible to take an altogether gloomy view of life they had at first tried hard to be miserable but nature was against them and the effort had been a failure in their free life they could no more resist the infection of happiness than the birds in the trees could refrain from singing and so it came to pass that in view of the bountiful harvest they had gathered and the comfortable house they had built and all the domestic conveniences they had contrived lieutenant coleman came out boldly in favor of setting apart thursday the twenty-fourth day of november as a day of thanksgiving and quite forgot to name it a day of humiliation as well to this the others joyfully agreed and agreed moreover that from that day forward the plateau should be called lincoln territory in memory of the patriotism of the good president notwithstanding they felt that his divided counsellors and incompetent generals had wiped the half of a great nation from the map of the world when this first holiday dawned on the mountain the three soldiers arrayed themselves in full uniform for the ceremony of naming their possessions bromley and philip buckled on their cavalry swords and slung their carbines at their backs and lieutenant coleman for the last time assumed his discarded rank to take command the arms had been polished the day before until they gleamed and flashed in the morning light and the little army of two was dressed and faced and inspected and then left at parade rest while lieutenant coleman brought out the flag how their honest hearts swelled with pride to think that here alone in all the world that flag would continue to float with an undiminished field of stars little did they dream that on that very morning hundreds like it were waving in the heart of georgia over sherman's legions on their march to the sea when at last it blew out from the staff they gathered under its folds and sang the star-spangled banner with tears in their eyes and as the last words of the good old song rang out over the mountain top philip and bromley discharged their carbines and all three cheered lustily for the old flag and the new name this was to be their last military ceremony and having no further use for their swords they arranged them with belts and scabbards into a handsome decoration against the chimney-piece and crossed above them the three red and white flags of the station the revised army regulations and philip's prayer-book stood on the mantelpiece alongside the spy-glass in its leathern case the few articles of extra clothing hung in a line on the wall just opposite to the three bunks whose under layer of pine boughs gave an aromatic perfume to the room 
after the ceremony of naming the plateau and having fixed the trophies to their satisfaction the three exiles took down their sky-blue overcoats from the line for the november air was nipping cold and set out with the two carbines and an empty sack to keep thanksgiving in the good old country way they were still rather sad after what had happened in the morning but by the time they were back all the gloom had worn off for they brought with them two rabbits and a bag of chestnuts and appetites sharpened by exercise in the keen air philip made the stew and bromley fried two chickens of their own raising one after the other on a half canteen and the potatoes left to themselves burst their jackets in the ashes with impatience to be eaten each man made his own coffee in his own blackened tin cup and drank it with a keener relish because it was near the last of their commissary stock while they were eating and drinking within the sky without had become thick with clouds blown up on the east wind so that when they looked out at the door they saw tumbler the bear who also had been stuffing himself with acorns and ants which he had pawed out of a rotten log rolling home for shelter there was yet time before the storm broke and away they went up the hill as happy as lords to load themselves with dead chestnut limbs and a few resinous sticks of fat pine and when night came and with it the rain there was a warm fire in the new chimney and a stick of light wood thrust behind the back log lighted the interior of the house with a good forty adamantine candle power tumbler lay rolled up in his favorite corner blinking his small eyes at the unusual light and from time to time he passed his furry paw over his sharp nose and gave forth a low grunt of satisfaction philip sat against the chimney opposite tumbler stirring chestnuts in the ashes with a ramrod while bromley put away the last of the supper things and lieutenant coleman gazed out of the open window into the slanting rain which beat a merry tattoo on the shingles and tossed at intervals a sturdy drop on the hissing fire it was certainly not the cheerful interior beaming with light and heat that turned lieutenant coleman's thoughts back to the dark cloud of disasters which had overwhelmed the national arms it might have been the dismal outlook from the square window into the darkness and the storm at all events he turned abruptly about as if a new idea had struck him george this sudden success of the johnnies has not been gained without important outside aid the french in mexico may have decided at last to cross the border and if they did it was in concert with the naval demonstrations of more than one european power against the blockade that is just what i have been thinking fred said bromley and england is sure to be at the bottom of it after the sinking of the alabama there was no time to be lost and when grant's army began to fall back from richmond that hostile government had the excuse it had long been waiting for and recognized the confederacy at once i am of the opinion replied lieutenant coleman thoughtfully that the recognition of the european powers came before the withdrawal from richmond because grant would never have yielded that position except in obedience to orders from washington now would he no he wouldn't said bromley of course not said philip it all began with the death of uncle billy so it did said bromley and after sherman's army was out of the way johnston probably joined his forces with hood defeated thomas and retook chattanooga he could hardly have accomplished all that by august twenty but his cavalry must have struck our line of stations on that date exactly so george lieutenant coleman responded if they had captured the tenth station alone with captain swan the line would have been useless and no further messages could have reached us if swan had found the line broken behind him he would certainly have flagged that news to me without delay well what's the odds said philip drawing his chestnuts out upon the hearthstone the jig was up and captain swan knew it if they had taken any station this side of the tenth mountain the effect on us would have been the same oh, so it would said lieutenant coleman sadly turning again to look out into the storm so it would it is a blessing that we are ignorant of some things that have happened said bromley who was disposed to look on the dark side it would have been just like lee's impudence after washington was garrisoned to cut loose with his army and live on the country through maryland pennsylvania and new jersey until he reached his foreign allies in the port of new york 
if he has done that for instance i should rather not know it well continued bromley there is one comfort if the rebs conquer everything they will defeat their own purpose and re-establish the union they sought to destroy yes said lieutenant coleman but it would be a union with slavery everywhere they can turn the northern states back into territories and carry slavery into massachusetts bah exclaimed philip to think of the territory of ohio the territory of pennsylvania the, the, the territory of new york dear me said lieutenant coleman it is all too humiliating to think of after all what a miserable figure abraham lincoln will cut in history think of it his emancipation proclamation is not worth the paper it was written on ten thousand furies cried bromley striding across the earthen floor and kicking the logs until the fire danced in the chimney we made a wise choice when we determined to stay on this mountain but we did make a mistake when we named the plateau lincoln territory cried philip that's so said bromley and lieutenant coleman with one voice it's not too late yet shouted bromley sherman sherman was the only general worthy the name and they all cried sherman sherman and by common consent after all the ceremony of the morning the name of the plateau was changed to sherman territory chapter x the prisoners the ledge up which the ladders led from the direction of the gorge it will be remembered formed the northern support of the plateau the unscalable cliff terminated its extent to the south and of the two longer sides the one on the west overlooked whiteside cove and that on the east cashier's valley the view into the cove over the boulder side of the mountain after the trees which grew on the edge were reached was broad and unobstructed on the eastern side there was but one gap in the timber which covered the mountain side from the end of the ledge to the cliff through which a perfect view could be had of the settlement in the valley before andy zachary left the plateau lieutenant coleman had sketched a rude plot of the mountains overlooking the valley and at the guide's dictation had written down the name of each peak yellow mountain was the nearest and showed a dark timbered ridge beyond the gorge at the northern end of the valley rose the mass of sheep cliff and joined to it were the lesser ridges of big and little terrapin hog's back showed its blue top ten miles away to the east behind the nearer wooded ridges that shut in the valley on that side down to rock mountain and chimney top which reared their sharp peaks to the right of the plateau directly below this eastern outlook lay the one white road which ran through the valley the same road along which the cavalcade had picked its silent way in the small hours of the morning five months before when they had come full of hope to establish the station our exiles up to this time had been so busy with their preparations for winter that they had given but little attention to their neighbors below they had noticed on frosty mornings columns of white smoke rising straight into the air from half a dozen cabins in the valley most of which had been hidden from view by the thick foliage during the summer months now that the november winds had stripped the trees of their leaves two cabins appeared in the direction of sheep cliff standing side by side among the bare oaks on a knoll which sloped gently to the road the two seemed to be precisely alike with rude verandas in front and at no great distance back of these in an open clearing surrounded with orchards and stacks was a long house with a heavy stone chimney at each end scattered to the right of the plateau were several cabins and close on the road a square brown building which looked to be a store just below this point of rocks where the three soldiers looked down on the valley stood the largest house in the settlement old and rambling in construction with lurching chimneys and roofs extending to left and rear the woodpile was at the opposite side of the road and comfortable log barns stood on the hillside above all these details were to be seen with the naked eye but the powerful telescope of the station revealed much more even showing the faces and forms of the people who lived in the cabins as the three exiles were lounging together one afternoon at this very point of rocks studying their neighbors through the telescope as if they had been the inhabitants of another planet philip broke the silence with quite an original speech one only he could make 
see here fellows he said with that new familiarity they had begun to show toward each other as we are likely to take considerable interest in these people down below it will be mighty inconvenient when we talk about them to say the man in the big house across the road from the log barn did this or the man in the farthest twin cabin did that or the old chap in the long house flanked by orchards and stacks did something else so i say let's give them family names the others laughingly admitted that the idea was not a bad one and bromley suggested at random the names smith jones and brown as good as any others said philip oh very well said bromley then we will call this first neighbor smith no you don't cried philip with much spirit i've taken a prejudice against that old fellow because he sits on the woodpile and smokes his pipe every afternoon while his wife does the milking smith is too respectable a name for him oh, i didn't know said coleman laughing that there was any particular virtue in the name of smith i didn't say there was said philip but if this first old loafer should turn out half as bad as i fear he will the name would be a slur on too many families you know now if it's all the same to you gentlemen we will begin at the other end and call the man of the orchard smith jones naturally falls to the owner of the second twin cabin and this fellow below becomes say a uh, shiftless whether he likes it or not as no one of the three had ever heard of any one of the name of shiftless philip's arrangement was agreed to and from time to time they settled other names on the dwellers in every cabin in sight and one column of smoke which rose from behind an intervening ridge was spoken of as thompson's smoke on the morning of december twenty three in that first year on the mountain the three soldiers were thrown into a great state of excitement by a remarkable discovery coleman and bromley were clearing off the snow from a stack of pea vines preparatory to beating them out on the floor of the house when philip came running toward them holding up the telescope and beckoning them to meet him he said he had seen three united states officers at the long cabin under sheep cliff which was known as smith's the others needed no urging to follow philip indeed they ran so rapidly over the frozen ground in the rare upper air that they scarcely had breath for speaking when they arrived on the point of rocks philip directed the glass on the house again and then with a cry of delight he passed it to coleman there they are there they are see by the end of the house as soon as the lieutenant had adjusted the powerful glass to his eye he had the men before him almost as distinctly as if they had been standing within hailing distance there was no mistaking the evidence that two of them were officers of what the three soldiers considered the beaten and disbanded army while although the third was in citizen's dress it was unlike the dress of the mountaineers heaven help them exclaimed lieutenant coleman as he gazed in amazement on the scene at the end of the long house how ragged they are they must have been hunted through the woods like wild animals both of the two in uniform wear jackets of the mounted service and eh, stop as sure as you are born the taller of the two is a lieutenant of artillery he has but one shoulder strap left and that has too dark a background for either cavalry or infantry they may be from the staff there is something about their uniforms in spite of rags and dirt that makes me think so the other carries a roll of blankets over his shoulder he must be a soldier and they've just come in too for their haversacks are mighty lean it looked as if the poor fellows had found friends at last for while they stood talking with two women at the end of the house smith himself who was a lank mountaineer with a red beard was lounging by the gate with his gun on his shoulder as if watching against surprise from the road bromley who had been patiently waiting now took the glass by jove he cried there are four girls there now and the short officer is going into the house you are right fred the old man is on guard with a sharp eye in his head too they are all going into the house now by neighbor smith's advice i fancy i'll tell you who they are fred they are escaped prisoners from charleston they must have been hiding in the woods and swamps for months if that is the condition of the officers of the united states that were a thousand times better is our lot on this free mountain top and returning the glass bromley ventured some bitter reflections on the congress and the high officials who had conducted the war to a disastrous end 
we must not lose sight of these unhappy men while they remain in the valley said coleman and it then being ten o'clock he settled himself behind the glass and gave his watch to bromley who was to relieve him at twelve philip was too much excited by the presence of the fugitive officers to leave the rocks of his own accord but coleman presently sent him to the house for a loaded carbine which was laid by in a dry niche of granite to be fired as a signal to the others in case of any movement of importance at the cabin below for the rest of the morning smith with his gun kept his post at the gate and the officers were never once seen outside the cabin judging by the volume of smoke from both chimneys it would appear that they were faring pretty well inside shortly before noon one of the girls ran through the bare woods to the two cottages overlooking the road and brought back jones who relieved smith at the gate it was evident that jones was friendly to the officers for when he was relieved in turn he went into the house and it was a long time before he came out whoever was on watch was seldom alone so keen was the interest of the exiles in the movements of their fellow-soldiers and in any other happening which might concern them according to philip who took the post of observation at four o'clock old shiftless bossed the milking from the woodpile as usual it was plain that he had not been taken into the confidence of the smiths or the joneses and this fact was laid up against him after supper all three gathered on the rocky outlook and remained observing the lights in the cabin of the smith long after it was too dark to use the telescope there were no signs of departure below and after they returned to the house chilled by exposure and inaction they sat until a late hour by the warm fire discussing the events of the day and laying plans for the morrow at the first indication of dawn bromley dressed and set out for the rocks while his comrades turned over for another nap which was taken with one eye open so excited were they in view of what might happen during the day in their drowsy half-wakeful state it seemed to coleman and philip as if no time at all had passed since the departure of bromley when they were startled by the echoing report of the carbine hurrying on their clothing they scampered across the hard snow to the rocks where they found bromley with the telescope fixed on the house of shiftless there the old rogue is said bromley handing the spy-glass to coleman leading his mule out of the stable he must have got some information during the night for after going to the stable with a lantern he climbed up on to that ridge beyond and looked over at smith's clearing as if he wanted to satisfy himself that all was quiet there i suspected he was up to some deviltry as soon as i got out here for i saw a light in the house showing first from one window and then from another drat his picture bromley continued as soon as he began climbing the hill i fired the alarm i never knew him to turn out before eight o'clock said philip he certainly means mischief said coleman for he is saddling the mule now he has blown out the lantern and hung it on the bar post now he's mounting the treacherous old villain confound him there he goes trotting down the road toward the store philip and bromley took a look at the man hurrying along in the gray of the morning before another soul was awake in the settlement and then they saw him turn on to the road which would lead him round the mountain into the cove if i were only down in his neighborhood now said coleman following shiftless with a telescope with a good rifle i'd tumble him off that mule i should be serving my country what country sneered bromley to this coleman made no reply and the three walked slowly across the mountain to the boulder side they had not long to wait there before the man on the mule appeared on the road below and they followed him with scowling eyes until he drew up in front of the cove post office dismounted and went in of course exclaimed bromley the postmaster is a creature of the confederacy in half an hour the two men trotted away together and soon disappeared among the mountains our heroes turned back certain in their minds that this stealthy journey of shiftless had been undertaken with hostile intentions toward the three officers who still remained in the cabin under the shadow of sheep cliff they felt keenly their inability to warn them of the danger which hung over them and hoped that during the day they might see the visitors leaving the valley 
their anxiety now made it necessary to watch for the developments in the cove as well as in the valley and they scarcely found time to prepare their meals which they ate as they moved about all day the telescope was in transit from one side of the mountain to the other until there was a deep path trodden in the snow from time to time one or another of the officers was seen near the cabin and even if they had not been seen at all the presence of smith or one of the girls watching at the gate would have been sufficient evidence that the officers were still there they might be waiting for a guide or the cover of night before going on the day was unusually cold and beyond the smoke from the chimneys and here and there a woman in a doorway there was no movement in the quiet valley late in the afternoon of this december twenty four for it was christmas eve and not a very cheerful one on the mountain bromley who was watching on the cove side spied a body of men at that very point in the road where the two horsemen had disappeared in the morning he shouted so lustily for the telescope that both philip and coleman joined him with all haste what they saw through the glass was a straggling column of mountaineers advancing in single file along the winding road their steel rifle barrows catching the last rays of the setting sun there were thirteen men in the party of whom about half wore some sort of a confederate uniform but neither shiftless nor the cove postmaster was with them they had scarcely time to pass the glass from one to another in their excitement before the men left the road and turned up the mountain side with a stealthy movement that made it plain they were going into temporary concealment a few extracts from lieutenant coleman's diary at this point give a vivid picture of what was happening during the night on the mountain and about it i am writing by the light of the fire in our house on this christmas eve at ten thirty o'clock by my watch powerless to warn our friends at the cabin of the impending calamity soon after dark fire appeared on mountain side and it is now burning brightly as reported by philip who has just returned to the lookout twelve midnight have just come in fire still visible twelve thirty five philip reports that fire has just been extinguished on mountain side sparks indicated fire was put out by beating and scattering the brands we are all about to go to point of rocks shall probably be up all night it seems that as soon as day began to dawn faintly on the mountain tops and while it was still dark in the valley the three soldiers were crouching on the rocks eagerly awaiting light in the clearing first the whitewashed walls of the cabin came into view and then in the gray dawn as they fully expected they began to distinguish motionless figures stationed at regular intervals in the clearing and forming an armed cordon about the house there was no sign of smoke from the stone chimneys nor any other evidence that the inmates had been disturbed by the soldiers or had awakened of their own accord there was one hope left the officers might have gone away during the night they should soon know and meanwhile the snowy mountains reared their dark ridges against the slowly reddening eastern sky and a great silence lay on the valley End of chapter ten chapters eleven and twelve of the last three soldiers by william henry shelton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven in which the soldiers make a map the forbearance of the captors to disturb their prisoners was puzzling to the three soldiers huddled together on the point of rocks through the telescope the men could now be plainly seen in their rough mountain dress moving to and fro on their stations and apparently keeping under cover where trees or outhouses were available as a mask at one point several men were grouped together behind a fodder stack as if in consultation and on the road could be seen one who seemed to be watching impatiently for some expected arrival holding the telescope soon grew tiresome and they passed it from one to another but no movement in the gruesome pantomime might escape their observation and the observer for the time being broke the silence at intervals with details of what he saw there cried philip at last the men are getting lively behind the fodder stack now the fellow in the road is waving his hat hold on there comes a man two men on horseback now the sentinels are moving in towards the cabin 
thus the cordon was drawn close about the house in which the inmates still showed no signs of life the horsemen dismounted and tied their horses to the fence and then with an armed guard advanced to the door lieutenant coleman looked at his watch it was twenty minutes after seven at seven twenty eight the old mountaineer appeared and was passed down the line to the road next came the three officers one after the other and they were removed to one side under guard then the four women seemed to be driven out of the house by the soldiers and forced along by violence into the road some of the men appeared to be breaking the windows of the cabin and others were running out of the open door appropriating some objects and ruthlessly destroying others for the first time the soldier exiles realized how far they were removed by their own will from a world in which they had no part the sufferers were their friends whom they knew not and to help whom they had no power they were like spirits looking down from a world above on the passions of mortals as helpless to interfere as the motionless rocks after a brief consultation the mounted men rode away to the north while the prisoners with their guards advanced in the opposite direction and soon disappeared behind that ridge up which shiftless had climbed to look over in the grey of the morning of the day before a puff of smoke burst from the deserted cabin and rose like a tower into the frosty air fire gleamed through the broken windows and red tongues of flame licked about the dry logs and lashed and forked under the eaves and about the edges of the shingled roof the reflection from the flames reddened the snow in the little clearing the stacks caught fire the boughs of the orchard withered and crisped in the fierce heat now as if satisfied with their work of destruction the men who had remained at the house joined the others behind the ridge and the armed guards with their miserable prisoners soon reappeared moving over the snow and under the bare trees the three soldiers lay out on the rocks above to watch the poor captives picking their way down a stony winding trail forming one straggling file between two flanking columns of mountaineers knowing something of the stoical ways of these people they could feel the silence of that gloomy progress they even fancied they could hear the crunching of the snow the rolling of displaced stones on the frosty hillside the crackling of brittle twigs underfoot and the subdued sobbing of the women steadily the procession of ill omen moved along over the snow under the thin trees disappearing and reappearing and dwindling in the distance until it was lost behind the spurs of the mountain called chimney top by this time the roof of the house had fallen into the burning mass between the two stone chimneys the sun had risen and the dense column of smoke cast a writhing shadow against the snowy face of sheep cliff when the glass was brought to bear on the house and the road below it revealed shiftless and the cove postmaster riding quietly home on their mules doubtless well satisfied with the evil deed their heads had planned as the three soldiers turned back in the direction of their house bromley was in a rage and philip could no longer command himself all three were worn and haggard with loss of sleep and depressed by the outcome of the affair in the valley in fact the disheartening effect of the experiences connected with the first christmas continued to oppress our exiles well into the next year if in the narrow valley on which they were privileged to look down three officers of the old armies had been thus hunted and dragged off before their eyes they had reason to believe that fragments of those armies were receiving similar or worse treatment wherever they might be found time and their daily work gradually calmed their minds and helped them to forget the pain of what they had seen they missed the company of the bear too for even before this great disturbance of their tranquillity that amusing companion of their solitude had burrowed himself away to consume his own fat where not even their telescope could discover him for several months presently the winter snows became deeper on the mountain and they were confined more and more to the house the slow john was frozen up in the branch and the fowls which could no longer forage for their own living hung about the door for the scraps from the table and an occasional handful of corn 
they roosted in the cabin of the old man of the mountain and now and then in return for their keep laid an egg which was often frozen before it was found the soft clean husks of the corn added to the pine boughs made comfortable beds and the tents spread over the blankets provided abundant covering great bunches of catnip and pennyroyal for tea hung from the rafters and even the wild gentian potent to cure all ailments was not forgotten in the winter outfit the prayer-book and army regulations which formed their library were read and re-read and discussed until theology and the art of clothing and feeding an army were worn threadbare philip who was blessed with a vivid imagination and great originality made up the most marvellous ghost stories and the most heart-rending and finally soul-satisfying romances which were recited in the evenings before the fire to the huge enjoyment of his companions if it was romance a fat pine knot thrust between the logs illumined the interior and searched the farthest corners and crannies of the room with a flood of light and in case it was a ghost story the logs were left to burn low and fall piecemeal into the red coals before the eyes of the three figures sitting half revealed in sympathetic obscurity one of the most interesting incidents of the first winter was the construction by lieutenant coleman of a map of the old united states and the plotting thereon of the confederacy as they supposed it to be when it is remembered that the map was drawn entirely from memory the clear topographical knowledge of the officer was to say the least surprising the first reference to the map is found in lieutenant coleman's entry in the diary for the twenty fourth of january eighteen sixty five as we were sitting before the fire last night george introduced a subject which by common consent we have rather avoided any reference to or conversation upon this related to the probable boundaries of the new nation established by the triumphant confederates we had no doubt that the confederacy embraced all the states which were the slaveholding states at the outbreak of the rebellion and as they doubtless had made washington their capital it was more than probable that they had added little delaware to maryland on their northern border we assumed that so long as there were two governments in the old territory the ohio river would be accepted as a natural boundary as far as to the mississippi but we were of widely different opinions as to the line of separation thence george who is inclined to the darker view is of the opinion that the southern republic if it be a republic at all would certainly demand an opening to the pacific ocean and therefore must embrace a part if not the whole of california february sixteen we have been confined to the house two days by a driving snowstorm and the territorial extent of the confederacy has come up again not however for the first time since the discussion on the twenty third of january as we still have one stormy month before the opening of spring i have determined to enter upon the construction of a map which shall lay down the probable boundaries of the two nations when george and i are unable to agree the point in dispute will be argued before philip and settled by the votes of the three on february seventeenth then this map was begun on the inner side of one of the rubber ponchos after buttoning down and gluing with pitch the opening in the centre it was stretched on a frame and thus provided a clean white canvas five feet square on which to draw the map if lieutenant coleman and his companions had known that general sherman after whom they had named their island in the sky and whom they mourned as dead was that very morning marching into the city of columbia the capital of south carolina with all his bands playing and flags flying the map would never have been made and the life on the mountain would have come to a sudden end fortunately for the continuance of this history they were ignorant of that fact and lieutenant coleman on this very day began plotting his map with charcoal after going over the coasts and watercourses and establishing the boundaries of states and that greatest and most difficult of all boundaries the one between the two countries he would blow off the charcoal and complete the details with ink of this necessary fluid there was a canteen full which had been made in the fall from oak galls 
lumps or balls produced on the oak leaves by tiny insects and the purple pokeberries which had been gathered from the field below the ledge the oak leaves had been steeped in warm water and this mixture together with the berries had been strained through a cloth and bottled up in the canteen while at west point cadet coleman of the class of sixty three had devoted himself to mapping and he believed he was tolerably familiar with his subject until at the very outset difficulties began to arise he found that his knowledge about the northwestern territories was shaky and it was difficult to convince bromley that arkansas was not west of kansas they finally gave little delaware to the confederacy accepting the bay and river as a natural geographical separation thence they followed the southern boundary of pennsylvania to the ohio river the ohio and mississippi to the southern boundary of iowa and thence west and south on the northern and western frontiers of missouri the indian territory became the first point of disagreement under date of march one eighteen sixty five lieutenant coleman says with the aid of philip i pressed the boundary line south to the red river we then conceded texas to the confederacy i was disposed to establish the extreme western boundary of the confederacy as identical with the western frontier of texas george allowed this so far as the rio grande formed a natural boundary along the frontier of mexico but stoutly insisted that the successful southerners would never consent to a settlement which did not extend their borders to the pacific ocean to this claim on the part of the south he contended that the imbecility of congress and the timidity of northern leaders would offer little or no opposition he held that if they took part of california they might as well take the whole and in either case they would take new mexico and arizona as the natural connection with their pacific territory i contended that california had never been a slave state and would never consent to such an arrangement to this george replied that california was without troops and that her wishes would not be a factor in the solution of the problem that the south flushed with victory could not be logically expected to content itself with less that it would be a matter to be settled between the two governments and that for his part he saw no reason to believe that the north in view of its blunders civil and its failures military would have the power or the courage to prevent such seizure by the enemy philip leaned to this view and was even willing to throw in utah for sentimental reasons bromley showed great skill and cleverness in advocating his peculiar views when he had a point to gain with the natural cunning of a legal mind he took care to begin his argument by claiming much more than he expected to establish thus not content with the concession of california and the southern tier of territories leading thereto he called the attention of the others to the great rocky mountain range offering itself from the northwestern extremity of texas to the british possessions as a natural geographical wall between the nations he admitted that the western men had been the bone and sinew of the late fruitless struggle but they were the hardy soldiers of illinois wisconsin iowa and kansas still far to the east of the great mountain range with vast uncivilized territories between to this view lieutenant coleman opposed the jealousy of the great ally of the south as not likely to favor an unequal partition he said that england would certainly not lend her aid to bringing the more aggressive of the two nations up to her own colonial borders besides he contended the south was without a navy and at the outset could never defend such a great addition to her already vastly superior coastline this long argument resulted in a compromise and by the decision of philip california arizona and new mexico were given to the confederacy and half the pacific coast was saved to the old government bromley's matter-of-fact character had no sentimental side he was a worker and no dreamer he threw himself with all the weight of his conviction and the force of his well-trained mind into the discussion of the extent of the confederate victory but the moment the boundary was settled he seemed to forget the existence of the map and to lose himself in the next piece of work 
after completing the outlines of the map in ink lieutenant coleman began laying a tone of lines over the whole confederacy as the work progressed the three soldiers watched the new power creeping like an ominous shadow over the map the one break in the expanse of gloom was the white star at the northwestern corner of north carolina which marked the location of sherman territory when the map was finished and hung on the logs the confederacy looked like nothing so much as a huge dragon crouching on the gulf of mexico with the neck and head elevated along the pacific and the tail brushing cuba although they accepted the map without further discussion its white face looking down on them from the wall as they sat about the evening fire provoked many a talk about affairs in the world below the time for the election of a new president had passed since they had been on the mountain after the complete and pitiful collapse of lincoln's administration they had no doubt that mcclellan had been elected philip thought the new capital should be located at piqua ohio which was where his uncle lived as it was near the centre of population but bromley favoured the city of cleveland ohio he pointed out extended entirely across the union and as the state which linked the two parts together it would need to be strongly guarded and the capital with its troops and fortifications would strengthen that weak link in the chain cincinnati was too close to the enemy's territory to be thought of as a capital shortly after undertaking the map lieutenant coleman had the good fortune to bring down a large gray eagle which although soaring high above the valleys was just skimming the mountain top this was a fortunate event because the very last steel pen had become very worn and corroded lieutenant coleman had been longing above all things for quills and now that he wrote again with an easy and flowing hand he seems to have forgotten that his supply of paper was limited in the controversy over the map the entries are of unusual length and then suddenly they become brief and cramped and are written in so small a hand that there can be no doubt the writer took sudden alarm on discovering how few blank pages were left in the book since christmas the telescope had rarely been taken from its place on the chimney and if they looked over into the cove or the valley without it those snow-covered regions below were far-off countries where the houses showed only as rounded forms and the human ants who lived in them were scarcely visible chapter twelve how the bear disgraced himself at last the long winter came to an end by the middle of march the warm sun and soft south winds began to thaw the february snows on such a day when the afternoon sun beat with unusual warmth on the northern face of the mountain the three soldiers stood together in front of the house noting everywhere the joyful signs of the approach of spring the snow where it lay thickest in the hollows of the plateau was soft and porous and grimy with dirt there were bare spaces here and there on the ground and where a stick or a stone showed through the thin crust the snow had retired around it as if it gave out a heat of its own the melting icicles pendant from the eaves glittered in the sun and dropped into the channels alongside the walls they had a great longing to see the grass and the leaves again and welcome the early birds of spring as they looked about on these hopeful signs in the midst of the great stillness to which they had become used a sudden deafening crash rang in their startled ears the sound was like the explosion of a mine or the dull roar of a siege mortar at a little distance away it came from the cove to the north and the first crash was followed by lesser reports and each sound was echoed back from the mountains beyond the first thought of the three soldiers was of the opening of a battle their first fear was that a great mass of earth and rock had fallen from the edge of the plateau to the base of the mountain they made their way cautiously in the direction of the sound almost distrusting the ground under their feet the gnarled chestnuts on the edge of the cliff were as firmly rooted as ever when they had advanced to where philip's sharp eye caught the first view of the postmaster's cabin through the twisted tree trunks he remembered the words of andy the guide on the night when they had waited for the moon to go down he quickly caught the arms of his companions it's the avalanche he said the icicles and the ice falling into the cove from the face of the great boulder 
they could see tiny figures standing about the cabin and they shrank back lest they too might be seen by the people who were evidently gazing with all their eyes at the top of the mountain just then there was another deafening crash and at intervals all day long they heard the falling of the ice they are the opening guns of spring said lieutenant coleman and now that they knew what the sound was they listened eagerly for each report late on that very afternoon as they sat together outside the house they saw tumbler the bear shambling down the hillside in front of the house and they had no doubt he had been awakened from his winter's nap by the roar of the avalanche he was thin of flesh and ragged of fur and so weak on his clumsy legs that he sat down at short intervals to rest he made his way first to the branch where he refreshed himself with a drink and then came on with renewed vigour toward the house he was such a very disreputable-looking bear and had been gone so long and must be so dangerously hungry that the men stood up doubtfully at his approach until they saw a weak movement of his stumpy tail and the mild look in his brown eyes as he seated himself on the chips and lolled out his red tongue philip brought him a handful of roast potatoes which he devoured with a relish and then stood up so handsomely to ask for more that they rolled him raw ones until his hunger was satisfied after which he waddled through the open door and lay down for another nap in his old place by the fire just as if he had gone out but yesterday which was probably just what he thought he had done by this time the last page of the station journal had been used and lieutenant coleman had added to it the five fly leaves of the precious blue book which he had cut out neatly with his knife paper was so scarce at last that on this march sixteen which was the day the bear woke up the circumstance of the avalanche alone was recorded and that was entered after the date in the most wonderfully small and cramped letters you can imagine now philip was of the opinion that the return of the bear was of quite as much importance as the falling of the ice it happened that he had in his breast pocket a letter which had been written to him by his uncle it was postmarked pica ohio and addressed philip welton company c second ohio infantry camp near resaca georgia philip had been looking over coleman's shoulder as he made the cramped entry in the diary now look here said he taking up the quill as it was laid down if you don't choose to make a record of the bear i will so taking from his pocket the letter he wrote across the top of the envelope whiteside mountain march sixteenth eighteen sixty five tumbler the bear woke up to-day signed philip welton george bromley frederick henry coleman well said coleman what are you going to do with that drop it over into the cove not a bit of it said philip i am just going to keep the record out of respect to the bear and with that as it happened he put the envelope back in one pocket and the letter in another but a few weeks later when the snow had quite gone and the buds were beginning to swell on the trees philip was chopping on the hill where the boulder side of the mountain joined the cliff above the spring and as he grew warm with his work he cast off his cavalry jacket and it happened in some way that the envelope on which he had written fell out into the grass philip did not notice this loss at the time and it was a week before he missed the envelope he kept his loss to himself at first but as he became alarmed lest it should blow over into the cove and disclose their hiding place he confessed to lieutenant coleman what had happened the three soldiers searched everywhere for this dangerous paper except in the snug place under the tuft of grass where it lay it was suspected that philip was repenting of the agreement he had made to remain on the mountain and both coleman and bromley lectured him roundly for his carelessness while philip was still chafing under the suspicion of his comrades all the more that he was conscious of his perfect loyalty to the old flag and to the compact they had made together for its sake the bear was growing stronger every day and more mischievous although he had the whole plateau to roam over nothing seemed to please tumbler so much as to nose about and dig into the grave of the old man of the mountain he was such a wicked bear that the more they kicked and cuffed him away the more stubbornly he came back to his unholy work 
and then it appeared that the light soil of the mound had been taken possession of by a colony of ants it was a temptation such as no hungry bear could resist and the sacrilege was so offensive to the three soldiers that they resolved to remove the last remnant of the ant hill and fill it in with clay in which no insect could live it was after supper when they came to this resolution and they fell to work at once with a wooden spade and a piece of tent cloth in which philip carried the dirt a stone's throw away and piled it into a new mound the bear seemed to think this was all for his benefit and while the work went merrily on he rooted into the new heap and wagged his stumpy tail with every evidence of gratitude and satisfaction it was a sufficiently disagreeable task for coleman and bromley whose legs and bodies were bitten by the ants until they danced with pain at the same time the little pests went up philip's sleeves and came out on his neck bad as the business was they set their teeth and kept at work determined to finish it now they had begun of course the colony was mostly near the surface of the ground but when they had gone down three feet into the sandy soil there were still ants burrowing about now bromley was a man of great resolution and perseverance and although it was growing dark he had no thought of stopping work so he called for a pine torch which coleman held on the bank above when the earth gave way the oak slab with the peculiar inscription one who wishes to be forgotten was tenderly removed and leaned against the hut to be reverently reset the next day annoying as the ants were the soldiers continued their work with that feeling of awe which always attends the disturbing of a grave and as they dug they spoke with charity and tenderness of the old man of the mountain it made them think of the time when they themselves would be laid to rest in the same soil and if they breathed any inward prayer it was that their remains might sleep undisturbed although they were young and death seemed a long way off the thought came to them of the last survivor and how lonely he would be and how when he should die there would be no one left to bury his poor body in the ground whatever happens said philip i don't want to be the last the pine torch flared and smoked in the cool night wind and lighted the solemn faces of the three soldiers as well as the hole in the earth where bromley still stood to his middle there was yet a little loose earth to be thrown out before they left the work for the night and philip had brought some sticks of wood to lay over the grave lest in the morning the bear should begin to dig where they had left off he had in fact come up and seated himself in the circle of light and was looking on with great interest at their proceedings i declare said bromley just then straightening himself i have gone too far already my spade struck on the coffin that is i think it did perhaps i had better see what condition it is in what do you think fred no said philip cover it up it will be as well said lieutenant coleman now that we have the opportunity to see that everything is all right i can't help feeling that the old man's remains are in our care hold the light nearer then said bromley as he got down on his knees and commenced to paw away the loose earth with his hands philip was silent and soldier though he was his face blanched in the neighbourhood of one poor coffin both the men outside were staring intently into the open grave the torchlight fell broadly on bromley's back and cast a black shadow from his bent body into the space below where his hands were at work well this is queer said he straightening his back and showing a surprised face to the light i've struck the chime of a cask no cried coleman and philip together yes i have said bromley hand me the spade now the work of digging was begun in good earnest and i am afraid with less awe than before of what lay below light as the soil was the opening had to be enlarged and it was hard upon midnight when the small beer keg was free enough to be moved from its resting-place with the first joggle bromley gave it there was a sound of chinking like coin do you hear that exclaimed bromley that's not the sound of bones it's money cried philip lieutenant coleman said nothing but jumping down to the aid of bromley they lifted it out on the grass where it rolled gently down a little slope chinkity chink chinkity chink bring the axe no let's roll it into the house it's money it's nails 
bring it into the fire said lieutenant coleman going ahead with the torch so they rolled the tough old cask chinkity chink around the cabin and up to the house and into the open door and across the earthen floor and set it on end on the stone hearth they were reeking with perspiration coleman threw the torch upon the smouldering logs and by the time bromley had the axe there was a ruddy light through the room stand back he cried as he swung the axe aloft three times the axe rang on the head of the cask the firelight glittered in the eyes of the soldiers before the strong head gave way on one side and three golden guineas bounced out on to the hearth bromley dropped the axe and then all three without deigning to notice the gold pieces upon the floor thrust their hands deep down into the shining mass of gold coin all hustled and pushed one another at the opening philip was on the point of striking out right and left in sheer excitement and in their scramble the cask was overturned so that the yellow pieces poured out upon the floor and the hearth and some flopped into the fire while others rolled here and there into the dark corners of the room the golden guineas which first appeared were now covered with gold double eagles and there were a few silver coins in the bottom of the cask the three soldiers hugged one another with delight we are rich cried philip let's count our treasure said coleman the double eagles first fifty to a thousand forgotten was the old man of the mountain forgotten were their weariness and the lateness of the hour as they eagerly fell a-counting they piled the shining yellow columns on the mantelpiece and when that was full without stopping to count the thousands they began bunches of piles on the hard floor they could hardly believe that such a treasure had fallen to their possession in their greedy delight they utterly forgot the old flag of the thirty-five stars and the total defeat of the union armies as they toiled and counted philip was the first to yield to the demands of tired nature with his hands full of gold he sank down on his bunk and fell asleep lieutenant coleman was the next and as the cock began to crow at earliest dawn bromley bolted the door for the first time since the house had been built and crept exhausted into his blankets the treasure was found as shown by the diary on friday april fourteenth in the year eighteen sixty five on the very night of the murder of the good president whom the three soldiers believed to be living somewhere a monument of failure and incapacity the entry was in a few brief words and by the sunday which followed lieutenant coleman would not have exchanged the four blank leaves of the diary for the whole treasure they had dug up after the first excitement of their discovery they began to realize that the yellow stamped pieces were of no value except as a medium of exchange and that as there was nothing on the mountain for which to exchange them they were of no value at all if they had found a saucepan or a sack of coffee in the cask they would have had some reason to rejoice so it fell out that within a week's time the gold was looked upon as so much lumber and the cask which held it was kicked into a dark corner neglected and despised some of the coins were even trodden under foot and others lay among the chips at the door on the evening of the second sunday after the discovery of the gold they sat together outside the door of the house and tried to think of some likely thing the cask might have held more useless than the guineas and the double eagles and hard as they tried they could name nothing more worthless the result was that they turned away to their beds feeling poor and dissatisfied and down on their luck now it happened as the three soldiers lay asleep in their bunks that night and while tumbler slept too with his nose and his hairy paws in the light cool ashes of the fireplace for the nights were warm now there came up a brisk wind which blew across the mountain from the southwest this rising wind went whistling on its way tossing the tree-tops up on the hill above the birches whirling the dry leaves across the plateau scattering them on the field below the ledge and even dropping some stragglers away down into the cove far below at first this wind only shook the tuft of grass that overhung the lost envelope and then as it grew stronger whirled it from its snug hiding-place and tumbled it over and over among the dry chestnut burrs and the old grey dead limbs if the envelope came to a rest this wind was never content to leave its plaything alone for long 
when it landed the little paper against a stump and held it fluttering there until that particular gust was out of breath the envelope fell to the ground of its own weight only to be picked up again and tossed on little by little always in the same direction until at last it lay exposed on the brow of the hill to a braver and stronger blast which lifted it high into the air and sent it sailing over the roof of the house this envelope with the names of the three soldiers and their hiding-place written out in a fair round hand might have sailed along on the southwest wind until it fell at the door of the post-office in the cove but for the queer way it had of navigating the air it would turn over and over on its way or shoot up or dart to one side or take some unexpected course and so just as it was sailing smoothly above the house its sharp edge turned in the wind and with a backward dive it struck hard on the rock below philip's leech just a breath of wind turned it over and over on the stone until it fell noiselessly into the pool of lye now lieutenant coleman chanced to come out first in the morning and when he saw the lost envelope floating on the dark brown pool alongside a hen's egg which had been placed there to test the strength of the liquid he was glad it had blown no farther the paper had turned very yellow in the strong potash and so he fished it out with a twig and carried it across to the branch by the slow john and dipped it into the water when he picked it out it was still slimy to the touch and the letters had faded a little he brushed a word with his finger and the letter dissolved under his eyes he gave a great cry of joy for in that instant he saw the possibility of converting into blank paper for keeping their records the five hundred and ninety-four pages of the revised army regulation of eighteen sixty three end of chapter twelve chapters thirteen and fourteen of the last three soldiers by william henry shelton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen how the bear distinguished himself if the old man of the mountain was not in his grave where was he he had certainly not gone back to the world and left the buried treasure behind him if the grave had been empty the soldiers might have suspected foul play josiah woodring who had been his agent and provider had already been five years in his own grave at the time they had arrived on the mountain as long as they believed that the bones of the old man were quietly at rest under the oak slab in the garden spot the condition of the hut neglected and going to decay was sufficient evidence that he had died there and that no one had occupied it for more than five years before with almost his last breath josiah had announced his death to the doctor from the settlement and under such solemn circumstances it was impossible to believe that he had stated anything but the truth he had not mentioned it is true the precise time when the old man died after the night when the treasure was found the three soldiers to thoroughly satisfy themselves had cleared away the earth down to the bedrock indeed the cask itself was evidence enough that the bones of the old man were not below it for he himself must have buried that if josiah had known of its existence it would certainly have travelled down through the settlement in his two-steer cart like any other honest cask and neither cattle nor driver would have ever come back after taking such a load to market josiah would have established himself in luxury in his ignorant way and probably cut a great splurge in the low country with no end of pomp and vulgarity the three soldiers studied this problem with much care weighing all the evidence for and against they even hit upon a plan of determining when the old man came limping through the settlement of cashiers behind josiah's cart covered with dust and staggering under the weight of his leathern knapsack they emptied out the little keg of gold on the earthen floor a second time and began a search for the latest date on the coins some were remarkably old and badly worn a few of the guinea pieces bore the heads of the old georges and dei gratia rex and the seventeen blank this and seventeen blank that and some of the figures were as smooth as the pate and as blind as the eyes of the king on the coin 
the newest double eagles and there were quite a number of them bore the date eighteen thirty three so it must have been in that year or the year following that the old man without a name had given up the world and become a hermit on the mountain they decided that he must have had his own ideas about the vanity of riches and that after doling out his gold or more likely his small silver pieces with exceeding stinginess to josiah for the small services rendered him when he saw his end approaching he had buried the cask of treasure and set up the slab above it trusting to the superstition with which the mountain people regarded the desecration of a grave to protect the gold for all time it would certainly have protected it from any examination by the soldiers but for the strange behaviour of the bear who had no delicate scruples the old man had probably told josiah with a cunning leer in his eyes that the empty grave was a blind to deceive any one who might climb to the top of the mountain as the hunters had done long before and very likely he had given him a great big silver half dollar to wink at this little plan when death did really come at last to claim its own it was evident that josiah faithful to the old man's request had either taken his remains down the mountain or buried them somewhere on the plateau without mound or slab to reveal the place and as likely as not he had found enough small change in the old miser's pockets to pay him for his trouble thus the mystery of the old man of the mountain was settled by the three soldiers after much discussion and the cask of gold was trundled back into the dark corner of the house where they threw their waist and such guineas and double eagles as had joggled out upon the floor were kicked after it directly after the lost envelope had turned up in the pool of lye lieutenant coleman had made his arrangements for the manufacture of blank paper for the diary the blue book was his personal property but before commencing its destruction he counselled with bromley who as a man of letters he felt under the circumstances had an equal interest with himself in the fate of one half of their common library bromley seated on the bank alongside the leech was engaged at the time in making a birch broom and as he threw down the bunch of twigs a shade of disappointment overspread his handsome face he said that he had never thoroughly appreciated the work of the learned board of compilers until his present exile and that it contained flights of eloquence and scraps of poetry if you read between the lines but putting all joking aside said bromley begin with a single leaf by way of experiment and let us see first what will be the effect on the fibre of the paper and then if everything works well we will first sacrifice the index and the extracts from the acts of that renegade congress whose imbecility has blotted a great nation from the map of the world lieutenant coleman had more confidence in the result of the experiment they were about to make than had bromley for the increased length of his entry in the diary shows that he was no longer economizing paper april twenty sixth eighteen sixty five wednesday we have cut out ten leaves of the index of the blue book which we scattered loosely on the surface of the lie in the cavity of the rock after twenty minutes i removed a leaf which had undergone no perceptible change in appearance and washed it thoroughly in running water while so doing i was pleased to find that with the lightest touch of my fingers the ink dissolved leaving underneath only a faint trace of the letters which would in no way interfere with my writing it required much patience to cleanse the paper of the slimy deposit of potash thursday april twenty seventh eighteen sixty five of the leaves prepared yesterday two which were less carefully washed than the others are somewhat yellowed by the potash and show signs of brittleness april thirty we have continued our paper-making experiments and find that a longer bath in a weaker solution of lye has the same effect on the ink and is less injurious to the fibre of the paper philip has burned a lot of holes in one of the cracker boxes in which we place the leaves leaving them to soak in the running water thus it turned out that the dangerous envelope by a freak of the sportive wind was made to play an important part in the economy of the exiles while the cask of gold stood neglected in the corner and the summer of eighteen sixty five began with no lack of paper on which to record its events both philip and the bear had been in temporary disgrace 
the one for losing the tell-tale envelope and the other for disturbing the sacred quiet of a grave both cases of misbehavior had resulted in important discoveries but the mishap of philip had produced such superior benefits that the bear was fairly distanced in the race this may have been the reason that prompted tumbler to try his hand or rather his paw again for he was a much cleverer bear than you would think to look at his small eyes and flat skull at any rate one hot morning in july he put his foot in it once more and very handsomely too for the benefit of his masters it was philip who caught the first view of him well up on the trunk of the tallest chestnut on the plateau which growing in a sheltered place under the northwest hill had not been dwarfed and twisted by the winds like its fellows higher up at the moment he was discovered he was licking his paw in the most peaceful and contented way while the air about his head was thick with a small cloud of angry bees darting furiously among the limbs and thrusting their hot stings into his shaggy coat seeming to disturb him no more than one small gnat can disturb an ox the soldiers had been deprived of sweets since the last of the sugar had been used in the early winter and a supply of honey would just fit the cravings of their educated taste share and share alike bear and man was the unwritten law of sherman territory and so while philip shouted for the axe he began to throw clubs at tumbler which were so much larger and more persuasive than the stings of the bees that the bear began promptly to back his way down the trunk of the tree coleman and bromley appeared in a jiffy casting off their jackets and rolling up their sleeves as they came when the chips began to fly tumbler sat down to watch evidently feeling that some superior intelligence was at work for his benefit while the stupid bees kept swarming about the hole above except a few stray ones who had not yet got tired of burrowing into the shaggy coat of the bear and these now turned their attention to the men and were promptly knocked down by wisps of grass in the hands of coleman and philip while bromley plied the axe if only they had had a supply of sulphur by waiting until the bees were settled at night they could have burned some in the opening made by the axe and with the noxious fumes destroyed the last bee in the tree then too if they had been in less of a hurry they might have waited until a frosty morning in november had benumbed the bees but in that case tumbler would have eaten all the honey he could reach with his paws as it was the swarm extended so low that as soon as the axe opened the first view into the hollow trunk the bees began to appear and the opening had to be stuffed with grass and a bucket of water which philip brought did not come amiss before the chopping was done all this time tumbler licked his jaws and kept his beady eyes fixed on the top of the tree like a good coon dog and never stirred his stumps until with the last blow of the axe the old tree creaked and swayed at the top and fell with a great crash down the hill the three soldiers ran off to a safe distance as soon as the tree began to fall while tumbler after regarding their flight with a look of disgust walked deliberately into the thick of the battle and began to crunch the dripping comb as coolly as a pig eats corn the brittle trunk of the old tree had split open as it fell and for twenty feet of its length the mass of yellow honey lay exposed to the gaze of the men while the infuriated bees darkened the air above it and made a misty halo about the head of the happy bear the happiness of tumbler was not altogether uninterrupted for the soldiers drove him off now and again with sticks and stones but however far he retired from the tree he was surrounded and defended by such an army of bees that it was quite out of the question to capture him there was no end of the honey but the worst of it was the bear was eating the whitest and newest of the combs and when at last his greedy appetite was satisfied and he came of his own accord to the house he brought such disagreeable company with him that the soldiers got out through the door and windows as best they could leaving him in undisputed possession very much as his lamented mother had held the ford on that night when her little cub tumbler had slept in the ashes the year before there was nothing else to be done but to walk about for the rest of the day for until nightfall there was a line of bees from the house to the tree 
the soldiers secured the bear by closing the door and windows but it was not yet clear how they could obtain the honey coleman and bromley were city bred but philip had been brought up in the country and he had received some other things from his uncle besides kicks and cuffs and a knowledge of how to run a mill he remembered the row of hives under the cherry trees beyond the race and how the new swarms had come out and then sawed off with the limbs at great bunches or called out of the air by drumming on tin pans and how at last they had been enticed into a hive sprinkled inside with sweetened water so under philip's directions a section of a hollow log was prepared covered at the top and notched at the bottom and pierced with cross sticks to support the comb as a temporary bench for it to rest upon they blocked up against the back wall of the house the oak slab which they no longer respected as a gravestone after it became quite dark the bees had so far settled that a few broken pieces of honeycomb which had been tossed off into the grass from the falling tree were secured to sweeten the new hive and it was finally propped up on the rubber poncho in front of the thickest bunch of bees tumbler was kept a close prisoner in the house and early the next morning the bees began crowding after their queen into their new house and by the afternoon they were carrying in the honey and wax on their legs so it was the second night after cutting the bee tree before the soldiers removed the hive wrapped about with a blanket to the bench behind the house and got access to the honey in the broken log there was so much of it that after filling every dish they could spare they were forced to empty the gold on to the earthen floor and fill the cask with some of the finest of the combs what remained was given up to the bear and the bees who got on more pleasantly together than you can think and in time they cleaned out the old log and scoured the wood as if they had been so many housemaids during the remainder of the summer the gold lay neglected in the corner together with certain wilted potatoes and fat pine knots and the sweepings of the floor if a shining coin turned up now and then in some unexpected place it doubtless served to remind coleman how handy these small tokens of exchange might be if there were any other person in all their world of whom they could buy an iron pot or an onion or it may have suggested to the clever brain of bromley some scheme of utilizing the pile as raw material worthless as the gold was in its present form in the hands of the soldiers so fertile of resource and so clever in devices to accomplish their ends it was not possible for so much good metal to remain altogether useless they soon saw that if they had the appliances of a forge they could tip their wooden spades with gold and make many dishes and household goods so after the harvest they set to work in good earnest to build a smithy and equip it in all respects as well as their ingenuity and limited resources would permit the first thing they did was to dig a charcoal pit into which they piled several cords of dry chestnut wood setting the sticks on end in a conical heap over this they placed a layer of turf and a thick outer covering of earth leaving an opening at the top several holes for air were pierced about the base of the heap and then some fat pine knots which had been laid in about the upper opening or chimney were set on fire these burned briskly at first and then died down to a wreath of smoke which was left to sweat the wood for three days after which the holes at the base were stopped and others made halfway up the pile late in november the dry warm earth about the charcoal pit was a favorite resort of tumbler and he tried several times to dig into the smouldering mass with results more amusing to the soldiers and less satisfactory to himself than those of any digging he had ever tried before when the smoke ceased to come out of these holes at the sides they were closed up and others pierced lower down and so on until the process was complete while this slow combustion was going on a pen was built about the fireplace of the old hut and filled in with earth to a convenient height for the forge the flue was narrowed down to a small opening for the proper draught and a practical pumping bellows made of two pointed slabs of wood and the last rubber blanket was hung in place 
besides nailing the edges were made airtight with a mixture of pitch and tarry sediment from the bottom of the charcoal pit and the first nozzle of the bellows was a stick of elder which was very soon replaced by a neat casting of gold bromley was the smith and his first pincers were rather weak contrivances of plaited wire but after half the barrel of one of the carbines had with the head of the hatchet been hammered out on a smooth stone into a steel plate to cover their small anvil block it was possible to make of the iron that remained a few serviceable tools while they now had good reason to be sorry that the gold was not iron they were thankful for all their providential supply of the softer metal and bromley toiled and smelted and hammered and welded and riveted in the smoke of the forge and the steam of the water-vat and turned out little golden conveniences that would have made a barbaric king or a modern millionaire green with envy so it came about that poor as they were the three exiled soldiers without friends or country they could call their own sat on three-legged stools shod with hundred-dollar casters and drank spring water from massy golden cups fit for the dainty lips of a princess chapter fourteen which gives a nearer view of the neighbor called shiftless with the events which closed the last chapter the three soldiers had been more than a year on the mountain they had become thoroughly settled in their delusion and more contented in their way of living than they would have thought it possible in the beginning ever to become the long war had come to an end in a way of its own and without any regard for the messages flagged from upper bald the soldiers of both armies had been disbanded and the good news had found its way into the mountain settlements at about the time the bear had discovered the bee tree far and near the union outliers had come in from their hiding places among the rocks and were gradually settling their differences with their confederate neighbors in which delicate process there was just enough shooting to prevent peace from settling too abruptly among the mountains in cashier's valley there was scarcely any difference of opinion and the old postmaster in the cove who had attended strictly to his duties and never spied on his neighbors was not molested under the new order of things or even deprived of his office on the very evening when the fires were first lighted under the charcoal pit it happened that two men were driving along a stony road which led into the valley over a spur of little terrapin all day the rain had been falling steadily and the team showed unmistakable signs of weariness the sodden ears of the mule flapping dejectedly outward and the steer halting to rest on every shelf of the descent as the light wagon creaked and splashed down the mountain in full view of the wooded face of old whiteside now relieved boldly against a twilight sky which showed signs of clearing the two men sat crouched on the wet seat with a border of sodden bedquilt showing under their rubber coats their wool hats dripping down their shining backs and the barrels of their guns pointing to right and left out of the dry embrace in which the locks rested as they mounted the next ridge the major was getting a little comfort out of a spluttering pipe and sandy was looking hopefully between the horns of the steer at the patch of clearing sky there are some humans a outlying on old whiteside to-night said sandy i allowed them critters had all come in what you're talking about growled the major i'm a-sayin said the other that there's somebody campin on the mountain it appears to be gone now but i certainly seen a light up thar the major only grunted as if the matter were of no consequence and then both relapsed into silence as the creaking wheels jolt over the rocks and grind down the mountain behind the bracing cattle the form of the steer grows whiter in the gathering darkness the men are evidently familiar with the country for presently they turn off the big road into a cart track the sides of the wagon are brushing against the dripping bushes as they push through the darkness with the fewest possible words now and then they see a light in the settlement glimmering damply through the trees and dancing and disappearing before them as the wagon lurches and rolls upon the weary animals struggling for a foothold on the shelving rocks at last they trot out on a sandy level and pass a log barn where a group of men are playing cards by a fire 
a little farther on a low line of lights becomes a row of windows casting a ruddy glow under the dripping trees and shining out upon the very woodpile where according to philip the man he had named shiftless was wont to sit and watch the milking hello inside cried the major hailing the house is elder long to home well he ain't fur off replied a tall woman in a calico sunbonnet and a homespun gown who came out on the side porch shading her eyes with her hand jest light out of your hack and come in to the fire and i'll carry the critters round to the stable sandy and the major clambered out of the wagon upon the chipped dirt with a polite inquiry after the news to which the woman as she seated herself on the bed quilt and gathered up the reins replied that the best news she knowed of was that the war was done ended the travellers walked stiffly into the house carrying their guns besides which the major held a cowskin knapsack by the straps which he dropped on the floor inside the door both men said howdy as they stalked over to the fireplace peering from under their hats at the shadowy forms of a number of women sitting in the uncertain light who answered howdy in return and then while the men took off their rubber coats one woman bolder than the others stirred the fire and thrust a pine knot behind the backlog presently the ruddy flames leaped up in the stone chimney and picked out the brass buttons on two butternut and gray uniforms and revealed the faces of the women evidently not over pleased at what they saw there was an awkward silence in the room for a moment and then a tall man entered followed by two others and then a party of three each man carried his gun and each said howdy to which the strangers responded but the conversation showed no sign of being general until the elder came in unarmed as became his peaceful calling his gun and powder horn however were handy in a rack over the door and as soon as his benevolent face appeared in the firelight the man sandy advanced from the corner behind the chimney and held out his hand you may ever disremember me elder in three years time said sandy rather sheepishly i ain't forgot you said the elder gravely stepping back a pace and crossing his hands behind his back i ain't forgot you been in the confederate army i reckon at which remark there was a rustle among the elder's friends and a murmur from the women jes so said sandy not at all disturbed by his cold reception and likewise my friend the major major mckinney sir to you said the major with a wave of his hand we're a studyin', said sandy about campin' down in this year valley we're all a one mind here sandy marsh exclaimed mrs long who had come in from the stable we're union to a man that's what we be in cashiers snapped one of the neighbors who was fondling his gun and then there followed a little movement of boots and rifle stocks on the floor which caused the major to get upon his feet with the intention of making an explanation there was a hostile flash in his eye however which elder long observed and stretching out his long arm he pointed to the major's chair now sit down comrade do said the elder and then to the others these two men are my guests to-night they'll have the best that the house affords and you better be layin the supper-table mother we'll feed them and their critters and welcome and when day comes they'll move on like mother put it we're of one way of thinkin in cashiers no offence gentlemen but it's plumb certain we couldn't agree under the advice of the elder the men stacked their weapons together the long rifles with the army guns and after supper was over the whole party returned to the fire in an amiable and talkative mood but with a perfect understanding that the two confederates would move on in the morning this point having been settled the travellers were listened to with the interest the stranger always receives in remote settlements where new faces and new ideas seldom come and the men of the valley who had been sullen and suspicious before they had broken bread now laughed at the droll adventures of the major and vied with him in story-telling on their own account the women had mostly been silent listeners up to the time when sandy mentioned the light he had seen on the crest of whiteside mountain as they came over little terrapin the major hastened to express a doubt of his companion having seen anything of the kind which the other as stoutly contended he had seen with his eyes open and that the light was not lightning or a stray star among the trees but real fire 
you needn't waste time a studying about that light sandy marsh said mrs long throwing the last stick on the fire which was only a heap of glowing embers tain't worth the candle since everybody in cashiers knows that mountain is haunted and has been ever since the little old man died up there all by hisself chimed in little miss bennett i ain't a great believer in haunts said the elder but if you viewed anything like fire up there it certainly wa'n't built by human hands for there ain't no possible way for a human to get there there's the bridge josiah woodring built sandy ventured to say i crossed over it myself once before the war time it fell into the gorge of its own weight and rottenness more'n a year back said the elder and it's certain that no man has set foot on the top of whiteside since the fresh stick which was only a branch burned up and threw a flickering light on the grave faces about the shadowy room in the midst of a general silence which was broken by the harsh voice of the mistress of the house it's obleeged to be the aunts and comes long of the bones of the little old man not having had christian burial up yonder you see said the elder his taking off warn't regular being altogether unbeknownst otherwise i'd have seen he had a gospel service said over him that would have left him layin easy in his grave which it stands to reason he can't do now put in mrs long under that heathen inscription they do say is writ on his headstone if he really wanted to be for god he'd better left word with josiah to bury him without so much as markin the place and everybody knows that unmarked graves holds uneasy spirits according to that doctrine miss long said the major whole regiments of haunts would be marchin and countermarchin over some battlefields i know tain't them that has plenty of company that gets lonely and uneasy replied the woman very promptly but such as lays by themselves on the tops of mountains or anywheres in the unknown country oh whitesides ain't never brought luck to anybody that owned it said a piping voice from a niche behind the fireside where granny white sat in her accustomed rocker the old woman was the mother of the mistress of the house and an authority far and near on all things supernatural her white frilled cap was just visible behind the stones of the jam and even the strangers listened with respect to what she had to say in a ghostly silence and in the half-light of the dying embers i've lived in a shadder of it for eighty years and there ain't many that's been a top of old whiteside order josiah built the bridge the hooper horned critters lay across the gorge one summer and two of the best cows lost their calves that must a been in fifty hey larkin son fifty wouldn't it that's true aunt lucy said the elder and a great mystery it was at the time some suspicion that the little old man might a killed him for meat but such of us as went up found his cabin empty and we could no more find him than if he had been a hunt himself this statement was received in silence which was presently broken by the garrulous voice of the old woman woe woe unto them that ventures on to the dangerous mountains the last man knowed to a set foot on white side was hiram kitchen and let me tell ye the haunts at to hand in burnin hiram kitchen's cabin on christmas day and totin him off along with his prisoners it was a plain judgment agin disbelief hey larkin son you're learned in scripture the elder only gazed at the feathery embers wherever the old man of the mountains is a-layin continued granny he ain't restin easy and there might be a reason for it too he had plenty of silver plenty of silver her voice sank to a husky whisper it's a monstrous lonely place up yonder somebody might a murdered him eh hey, larkin son somebody might a done that the old woman's words had a powerful effect on the simple crowd assembled in the shadowy room they were prone to superstitious beliefs and if the two strangers who had seen more of the world and had fought in real battles were less impressed than the others they kept a discreet silence in which the elder rose to his feet and uttered the evening prayer not forgetting to ask that they might be guarded from unseen enemies and from invisible dangers in the morning after the two confederates had driven away with their mule and ox team in search of a more congenial neighbourhood the elder seated himself on the woodpile to smoke his morning pipe and watch the milking mother said he after a while when his wife came forward between the well-filled pails i don't believe in haunts burning houses but there must have been some spirit information prejudicial to hiram kitchen that i never could get through my head the last thing i did afore i rode off to preach granny taylor's funeral sermon was to go up on the hill yonder and satisfy myself that everything was quiet around hiram's 
i never let on to the postmaster that there was any yankee prisoners around and if he knew of it he kept it to himself it certainly looks mother as if the spirits had a hand in it and a bad business it was that's it larkin's son said aunt lucy who leaned on her staff by the fence among the great purple cabbage heads when there's mischief going on and you can depend on it the hands has a hand in it and it's a fair mountain too she continued shading her eyes with her hand and gazing up at the wooded mass of white side behind which the sun was rising it's fair to view an innocent appearin but there's few has set foot on the top of it the mountain which harboured no spirits other than the guileless souls of the three deluded soldiers was indeed fair to look upon towering above its fellows and above the sweet valley of cashiers a curtain of purple haze softened the rich greens of the forest which clothed the mountain on the valley side and now after the rain white clouds of vapour were beginning to puff out as if huge concealed boilers were generating steam behind the trees End of chapter 14